I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Okay, here we go. Man, we've been in the studio this week, Bobby. We were supposed to have some coyotes howling when this thing started, and uh, I don't know what happened to them. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> there they are. There they are. I'm going to tell you, growing up is that at one? the edge of a, uh, of a 100 acre cow pasture, that reminds me of my childhood. I tell you, this couch can sound scary. One couch can sound like. Oh, like a whole bunch. Yeah. yeah I, I hate to admit that, but. Uh, I recently found out that when you think you hear 20 of them, it could be like one or two or three of them. Well, so, we're going to find out today. We're going right? to learn a lot about coyotes today. Yes, we yeah, are. We've, I, uh, look, I, I recently, how, let, let me just go ahead and introduce her, please. I, I, that, I will get that off, off the plate here. We've got, so Mississippi State, right down the road, we've just had Our some, favorite university. Yes, Dr. Bronson Strickland, he, he never... Leads me wrong when we, when we request for, hey, do you know anybody that knows this? So we found out about this lady over there, Dr. Uh, Dana Morin. Am I pronouncing Morin. that right? Morin. That's Morin. Morin. Yeah. I'm, I'm, he's I'm he's not real good. Name. He's not real good at this. <laughs> Sometimes I think he does it on purpose. <laughs> so, uh, But we're so excited to have you here. And look, you're one of the, we've only had a few lady guests. Really? Really? It, That's exactly right. We last week we had our first guy with a ponytail, <laughs> and that took that me was, a little while to get that, adjusted. To that, that was this week. <laughs> was that, was that week? a man yeah. bun or a ponytail? Yeah, well, if he lets his thing down, it hangs down. You know, it's a ponytail. Okay, all right. So, but you know a lot about couch. You've been trapping couch, and we're going to get to ask you a lot of questions, Lanny. The way this happened last Christmas. So go back in time, thirteen months. I got a book for Chris. My daughter gave me a book called Coyote America. You have that, you have been enthralled with that book. Well, it took me a, it took me a while to for it to bubble up in my reading stack. And once I started, I was I was just really fascinated by the coyote story. And I started we so we we talk about hunting about them around here a lot and trapping them and all mm -hmm. that. But I wanted to spend just a, a, a dedicate kind of dedicate one podcast to this is a fascinating animal. And you're nodding your head, and we're on yeah. the radio here. Sorry, so. yes. No, they're they're amazing. You could study them for your entire career. They're fantastic. I mean, do you feel the same way? It's just oh yeah. I they I mean, yes. They 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 will intrigue you and frustrate you all at the same time, and that's what kind of like the allure of them. Yeah, oh, yeah I can see that. Well, we kind of hate them. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, but a lot of people I, seem to from a gamekeeper perspective. <laughs> yeah. But I have a newfound respect yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, as a predator, you hate them, but you're also, I'm enthralled by them, by their adaptability and, and how they can seemingly morph to any landscape. You their, know? their resilience. Yeah, it's, really it impressive. is. So, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't want them eating my fawns, but at the same time, I got a lot of, you know, respect for them just for, you know, doing what they do. And I'm sure we'll cover both sides of that aspect. Yeah. You know, you use the word hate, which is a strong That's word. That's a strong it word, is, Bobby. Strong word, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is amazing, though. Like, there are certain animals that seem to elicit, like, there's nobody who doesn't have an opinion mm -hmm. on coyotes or black bears and certain animals. Like, everybody has uh, a very strong response. Snakes right. is probably snakes, the main yes, one. Yes, exactly. So, and coyotes are really one of them. Like, mm -hmm. they elicit just a very, very strong emotional mm -hmm. response. Black panthers. Yeah. Oh, well, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite subject. <laughs> but uh, I'll. Uh, I know I'll, what I saw, Bobby. I know what I saw. <laughs> That's all I'm uh, telling you. I'm glad to have Dana here because uh, I went to that turkey symposium, uh, the oh. Mississippi Turkey Symposium, a yeah. uh, couple years ago. And Dana and Dr. Mark McConnell uh, were the two biologists there, the two scientists there, and they were having to deal with everybody's questions and comments. Uh, I would refer to that as the peanut gallery, but uh, <laughs> a lot of opinions and they were there to try to, uh, I don't want to say keep the peace, but, but talk the science side of, of uh, a lot of those opinions. 
And I was blown away with how well they did and all the cool words they knew. I, and so, I appreciate that. I really enjoyed that meeting. I think it was actually last February. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that because what, what's, what, what I get pleasure from as a, as a researcher is being able to actually share the accurate knowledge. Because it was a room full of people who deeply cared about the resource, everybody about turkeys. Cares for sure. And so to be able to try to get everybody on the same page about what we actually know about what was going on, that was really exciting from, and rewarding for me. Yeah. So I appreciate hearing that. Thanks. I bet. Mm. That, yeah, we, I remember Dudley coming back and talking about it. So, so let's do this. Let's take just pause one second. We're going to do it. Find out this episode is brought to you by, Mac, it's brought to you by our spring protein peas. We got them on sale. Can you tell us about that, how a guy can pre-order some? Yeah, so it's a plantbiologic.com exclusive. We're making, due to inventory, I mean, due to the actual crops. Yeah, I mean, there's a shortage of, of peas. Yeah, so it's an iron and clay and mung bean. Uh, in a 20 pound bag that covers an acre we've got a limited quantity it's a pre-sale free shipping 59.99 half acre yeah you. yeah half acre <laughs> it's we're liable to change that offering just due to to the to demand, the demand but sure. right now we're gonna we're gonna keep it running free shipping yeah so what order now it's gonna ship mid-april just in time for everybody whether in the north or south to ship so uh, just realizing that there's such a shortage, we wanted to give everybody an opportunity to kind of go ahead and make plans and, and get them secured before they hit the market. So. Yeah. And it's the, I mean, the most, arguably the most important time in whitetail. I yeah. mean, the antler genesis. The antler I genesis mean. time. So if you hadn't planted any spring food plots before, this is a great way to start doing that. Uh, I think you can broadcast them. Dudley, Bobby, jumping here about about the pea blend. Oh, uh, they're, uh, yeah. A lot it's easier, so easy to grow. Easy to plant, yeah. easy to grow. The deer love them. Uh, and you need you do need to plant the deer love them so much you need to plant at least a half acre in them so that's why we bumped this up to a twenty pound half acre size yep. so so you better get in line and get some better get in line they're going like hotcakes right now so, okay Mac yeah. what's the website plantbiologic.com Bobby you don't even know the website well, I like to hear him <laughs> say it he just sounds so he's it's my so favorite website it is he's got I'm a good radio the weather voice. channel <laughs> he really does so, okay so now let's turn our attention to Dr Dana Morin and I, I'm look. I'm going to call you Dana. If it's Please okay. do. That's okay. what I respond to best. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> Will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Obviously, you're well-educated to get to this position in life. Sure. Yeah, I kind of have an all-over career path to get here. So uh, I'm originally from New England. Um, I went. I actually went to LSU for my undergrad, uh, but I wasn't in wildlife yet because I didn't know that was a field you could actually go into. Like, wow. uh, hmm. uh, so I um, I have a degree that's broadly zoology and ecology from there. And then um, after that, I ended up in California. Um, I was in San Diego at San Diego State University doing a master's in ecology, and that's where I started studying coyotes because they were all over the place. Like hmm. people think that coyotes are thick in the southeast, and that you've not seen anything. Like they can be in urban wow. areas in no, Southern you- California. California, pull so. into your neighborhood and they yeah. might they might be sitting on top of somebody's car yep. <laughs> yeah you see them regularly and so I, I was doing research there on um, urban coyotes and how um, how that might be driving differences in mesopredator population so did they um, did they reduce activity of gray foxes and raccoons in areas and things like that um, and then from there I got into trapping bobcats with um, Uh, the National Park Service up in Los Angeles. And I went from there to Boulder, Colorado and was trapping bobcats there. And then I ended up getting a PhD position at Virginia Tech. So I went out to um, Southwest Virginia and was um, there I was doing, I was trapping coyotes and I got into some genetics as well. So genetic sampling as well there. Um, And so that was a really um, interesting population to be studying. I lucked into it because it turned out to be an incredibly high mortality coyote population. And we were able to estimate the actual density of the population using uh, non-invasive genetics. So collecting DNA from the fecal samples, we can identify individuals and we can tell how many are actually there. Um, And so this was a population where people thought there was a lot of coyotes. And the truth was there was so there were so few resources. It was an old uh, deciduous forest that hadn't been logged in over 30 years. Um, and it's you know, just, you know, no undergrowth and just tall trees. Um, there was so low, um, so, so few resources that there was actually very few coyotes. They were just spread out over a very, very large area. Like they had really large home ranges to accommodate the fact that they had to travel so far to get all the food they needed. So people would say it was interesting when you guys are talking about like, oh, I, you know, I hear them. And um, 
and and it could be one or 20, there'd be people even even with their home range sizes and how much they move, there'd be people saying, well, well, I know there's some up in this part of the county and there's some over here. I mean, look at their home range sizes and we got collars on them and they'd be the same animals. They're just mm. moving that much around in that particular area. So, um, so there, yeah, so that was where I, that's where I really took a deep dive into especially Eastern coyote ecology. Um, and then, yeah, and then from there, I've uh, I've kind of transitioned more into some some bears and some other carnivores, but uh, but they're still coyotes are still probably my favorite. So. Park, well, I'll park it right there. <laughs> yeah. It, I'll what, just you, look. You, Richie's I not sitting over there. Yeah, yeah. I, that's I, Rob. I, I, that's not Richie. That, that's not Richie. I know Richie has been trying to reach out to somebody at Mississippi State about doing a television. Would that be you? That's me. Would On you the please bears? return his phone call? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I just told him I would. I just told him. I would. So <laughs> we want to do a TV show about bears. Oh, bears! Yes. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. We're, we're, I'm, I'm working out. We, we're just getting the project off the ground. So. I, I was actually yeah, fixing to ask that about the bears. I'm like, wait, this is about cows, Lenny. Shut up. No, we've got the bears too. So we get really interested in all these animals. But how did so? How does all a, a lady from New England but get interested in zoology and end up in California and you know, there's a lot of woods in New England. <laughs> so, so is spent, hunting in your background? It's no. not actually. No, um, I I grew up kind of in the woods, but like in a in a, in a heavily wooded area, but but pretty close to New York City, quite honestly. Hmm. Um, and then uh, my family's from all over New England. And I spent a, quite a lot of time in Maine as well, and so that's where I just I always was obsessed. I'm terrible. Ask my students. I'm terrible at identifying trees or birds because I'm just constantly looking at the ground at tracks. Huh. Like that I just is the exact opposite of me. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> So, so yeah, and that was just forever. I'd always just, and I, I, you know, like animals, was interested in wildlife, was interested in, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty decent at math, so I was always interested in how those patterns and how things changed in relation to each other, and so that just really lent itself to ecology. So carnivores or something mm-hmm. that you that just interests you? Yeah, yeah. That's what I, I noticed <laughs> about her research. Uh, Oh, you did do homework. Between okay. her and her <laughs> colleagues on all these pubs is that uh, she's really into like trying to find a better way to monitor or model uh, these Good animals. Data. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's the math part. Yeah. The quantitative <laughs> yeah. part. That's a nice way to say it. Yeah. My, some of my colleagues joke with me that I write papers that are cranky about how other people are doing it wrong. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a cross between a literature review and a regular publication. But that's how you improve that's how you everything. Learn. That's right. It is. Find you the find gaps. the gaps. Find yeah. the gaps. Well, and, and, you know, the fundamental of wildlife population management is understanding how many there are to begin with. You can't, you can't assess how populations are changing without knowing how many there are. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that has been a cornerstone of my research for, mm-hmm. for sure. Very impressive. So Thank before you. I'm going to unleash Lanny with the first question, but <laughs> I want to ask you, am I right in understanding that right now today, as we sit here, that there is a coyote I need to ask you how do you how do you you <laughs> say coyote? It, it just depends on the day, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. so both are correct. I have a theory. Um, I think that in areas. So I grew up saying coyote, and then when I started working out west, it just kind of transitioned. It wasn't anything intentional. It just kind of transitioned, and I spent more time out there. And so um, so I think I still I still generally say coyote, but occasionally it just comes off coyote. My theory is that it depends on whether you grew up in an area with them or not, because I think if you grew up in an area with them, then people generally said coyote. And if you didn't, your first exposure was Wiley Coyote. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right, I believe. And yeah. so, you know, like, so I knew them as coyotes because of the oh, cartoon. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that, that answers that. Because I'm yeah. liable to say both during this part. Well, Me we're too. Talk, Me but too. I'm going to try to say coyote. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm gonna try. Nice. Okay, so, with the Latino yeah. Roberto. <laughs> I'm gonna need Roberto. a margarita if that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roberto. There he is. But am, am I, is it true that right now today that there is a coyote within a mile <laughs> of every person in the United States? I wouldn't be able to tell you who would be able to come up with that number accurately. <laughs> So, so I, I can't, I can't verify if that's true or not. We see a lot of stuff. Coyotes are very popular, right? For the same reason we're talking about. We see a lot of stuff where people will derive um, estimates and then, ex- and meaning that they'll, they'll take numbers that are in studies and then they'll extrapolate them in a way that maybe doesn't, isn't, isn't legitimate. And so I'm not sure where that's coming from. I, I, I know, I would say that we don't even know really how many there are. So it's hard to say that. Hmm. that there'd be one. But I will say 
that they are throughout North America, right? They are they they exist throughout North America, and there's probably a territory pretty close to. <laughs> but now, how yeah. large those territories are varies with the resources, right? So in so in urban areas, yeah, the probably that's probably accurate. Um, if you were up in Bath County, Virginia, where I was doing my research, their their home range sizes were much larger than that, so that wouldn't be an accurate number. So how large would an uh, an average home range be? Oh, I mean, it really depends. They can be like um, a quarter of a square mile in really high urban areas, and they can go up to like ten to twenty square miles in areas where it's where it's low resource. So yeah, just depending on the it quality just, of the resource. Yeah, yeah, it's called resource dispersion. Yeah. Um, the more dispersed the resources are, the more the animals have to travel to get those resources. And coyotes are really, really territorial. They really beat each other up. So so they're constantly defending their territory. So they maintain that. Um, that bumping area. The edges. Yep, mm-hmm. they're constantly bumping the edges. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You want to go yeah, ahead? You know, I, I, and I might be just dreaming this up because huh? I dream up a lot of stuff. So, hey, oh my God. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, but it seems like I've heard that at one point they weren't necessarily as far east as they are now. Is is that is there any truth to that? And can you kind of give us a time frame of when that happened and maybe why it happened? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the time frame is really important. Uh, At the time, what we call pre-Columbian, so before Columbus was here, there weren't coyotes in the east. Um, But they had been here multiple times before. Hmm. So, um, So what happens is... Let's see how far big a step. So there were dinosaurs. No, okay. So so there was um, there's the that there's this trade off that occurs in North American canids. So wolves and coyotes and foxes. But there's this trade off that occurs that as temperatures are colder, like and and you think about in more northern latitudes, there's selection for larger canids that hunt in groups because there's larger prey available to them. Makes sense. And as temperatures, as the climate changes and becomes warmer, or as you move farther south. Their selection for a more medium-sized predator or more medium-sized northern canid um, that's going to be able to take advantage of a lot of different variety of foods because there's not as much large game to, mm-hmm. to, to access. So as you imagine the ice ages and, and the glaciers retreating, uh, advancing and retreating over and over again, we have evidence of coyote-like animals um, that are, have shown up in deposits throughout the east um, at different points in those in those changes. So mm. So that's part of the explanation of why coyotes now are back east, is that the climate is, again, it's warmer than it was um, right. at other times. And then the other thing is that um, there is selection, that, that when you think about wolves and coyotes, like these are competitors, right? right. And wolves are larger, so they tend to push coyotes around. Um, and uh, wolves do better in, like, in thick forest, right? Mm-hmm. And coyotes do better in open habitats. And so when... When Europeans came in and they logged a large, extensive part of the east, they actually opened up the habitat, essentially, for it. And then they also pulled out their competitors as well and extirpated right. the wolves. So so there were two waves of, of coyote expansion, which is kind of neat because it happened like you know simultaneously. There was one wave that was going from the northern part of the United States or North America that was going up around the Great Lakes and then down through the Adirondacks. And then there's another wave that moved across from like the southwest across the southeast and then kind of merged in the Virginia area. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, Virginia, North Carolina area. Yeah. So competition and then habitat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yep. Yeah. I mean, animals, you think about natural selections, animals will go where they can eat and reproduce. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No doubt about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. so the pressure that was put on them out west when uh-huh. all that, where they were trying to kill all those predators, that was a major contributor to the no coyotes don't respond to harvest very well like that so she was talking about the harvest of the wolves yeah in the the south created less competition yeah okay yeah the harvest of wolves on the eastern part of the united like we've we we functionally extirpated wolves from most of Mm -hmm. the eastern part of the u.s and so the coyotes don't have the competitor that would typically keep their population levels a little lower so So. in the south it was a red wolf yes yep so i've got to ask what about the koi wolf is is it a so what what is it or is it is, is it, it a real? thing? And, yeah. So a koi wolf, yeah, uh, yes, but I don't like the name. Is that okay. a, is that an acceptable cool. answer? Yeah. So so a koi wolf was a term that was I I believe being adopted by some researchers to try to give it some kind of special status. Yeah. Um, but really, it's just wolves and coyotes hybridized because they're so closely related. So the the genetic difference between wolves and coyotes is the same. It, it, your dog and like and. I mean, and, and wolves, coyotes are more closely related to wolves than, than 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. Dogs are more, more closely related to wolves, but coyotes are kind of right after that. And so they can hybridize. Um, what keeps them from doing that is they just don't like each other. So, so there's selection. There's what we call positive assortment. They, they select to mate with individuals that look more like themselves. So if you're uh. a wolf, you're going to choose to mate with a wolf. But when there's really low density of population or really low density, you don't have that many other options, you might be okay with, with, <laughs> with a big a, cow. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so in areas like the um, uh, up, in, up in, in, in Canada where the eastern wolves are, those populations of those eastern wolves have dropped really, really low. And so we see hybridization occurring with coyotes there. Uh, same thing when they reintroduced um, red wolves to North Carolina and the coyote population expanded out there. We see selection for those red wolves that are out there. They're choosing red wolf mates when possible, but they're, when not, then they're, there's hybridization that occurs with coyotes. So, hmm. so it's, a, um, it's an opportunity thing. Yeah. So, they, so do they exist? Yeah. Do, would we expect them to become prolific? No. no gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So yesterday I was in a county in North Carolina that has red wolves. Uh -huh. And I, I it, it, we learned this through Dr. Michael Chamberlain, who was yeah. on one of our very first podcasts we did yeah. about wolves. Yeah. And, and no we learned about how they uh, restock this peninsula. And so I, I was in one of the counties that has them, and we were at a, a, a lunch with about eight or 10 people. Not one person at that table that lived in that county knew that they had wolves in that county. <laughs> yeah. I was so disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I was hoping to have a, a wolf story. Yeah, Somebody exactly. saw one run across the road, but they didn't even know they had yeah, them. Yeah. That's kind of bizarre. It, it is. It's a, it's, a, it's. I mean, it's a small population, and it's, I think, still a declining population, unfortunately. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. so a guy Googled it while we were talking, and he's like, yeah, there's nine of them left. And I was like, oh, <laughs> wow. I don't know the awful. total number, but yeah, it's, it's been there. It's been tough to, um, for the, it's been a tough run for that population. For mm. sure. So uh, if, if there's a pack of wolves and a, and a, they're going to kill a coyote if they encounter mm -hmm. They're going to chai. Yeah, or they're going to, you know, they're going to. Uh, and the same thing happens for coyotes with gray foxes. So huh. it's, it's all of them sh share similar resources. So the rule with competition is when you all kind of share the same resources, you're going to, you're going to be competing directly for food, trying to get to the food fastest if you're the same size. So red foxes and gray foxes do what we call exploitative competition. They're eating the same resources. And so if there's a bunch of red foxes, it's going to be harder for the, the gray foxes to catch up. But if you're a little bigger, you're just going to beat them up. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's, and then once you get to being that much bigger, wolves don't seem to care very much about foxes, right? But they care about the coyotes because that's more of a competitor. It's that intermediate range of, of size that makes a difference. So. <laughs> Um, do coyotes seem, are they more cyclical, like in their local populations, um, you know, where the, it kind of like boom ebbs bust. and flows? Yeah. I don't, I, I would say it's really going to be context specific, but I can't think of a population where that really does occur. Okay. And the reason why is that they're really, and, and you probably read this in, in Dan Flores's book, right? But they're really, uh, um, they, they, they really f seem susceptible to what we call density dependence. So I was talking about those territories. Each of those territories is a resource in itself. And so they won't be able to maintain a density over what, it, what they can have in those territories. So if there's eight territories in a county, then there will be eight family groups of coyotes. And if there's 80 territories in a county, then there'll be 80 <laughs> family groups of coyotes. Um, but it's all resource dependent. Um, and what happens is as individuals are removed from those populations, other ones just roll right in. Um, so they tend to have fairly stable populations in, from what I've experienced. But I've also, you know, I can say that. So all of my populations that I've studied have been heavily harvested. And that certainly keeps them very stable. Um, not, it doesn't make them decline, but it keeps them as a stable population. They're at least a, a fairly consistent number. Um, but... In, there was a population that was studied in Utah back in the 70s, and they actually had one population where they removed coyotes from and another population nearby where they left them. And what they saw was that one was stable, too, because you had males that were um, or you had you had individuals that would age in their in those territories that would still defend their territories, but they weren't reproducing as much because they were senescing. They were, um, so, so that was also a stable distribution. That's the hmm. only study I can think of um, right now where they weren't harvesting coyotes but yeah but overall they tend to be fairly stable i mean every mm. population does this a little bit but 
Um, but overall, the density say, seems to stay consistent, especially when you're harvesting them. Okay. Yeah. So that begs the question that, mm -hmm. like, uh, so around here, and and then the spring of the year, we were we're worried about turkeys yep. and and on the nest and stuff. But if we're tr trying to trap coyotes, as soon as one's removed, there's another one's going to move right back in. So yep. is the level just going to yeah. stay the same? Yeah, or, are we making progress by catching a few? It seems like we would be. No, but you might be having fun doing it, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they're, the, the alternative way to look at us, they're a great renewable resource. You can keep trapping them, and they're not going to decline. You know, like you, you'd have the opportunity to do that over and over again. Um, but no, and the, the, the work that, that my, my dissertation was showing and several other people have shown is that removal of coyotes um, doesn't change the population level. And that's because they're not regulated by predation. They're regulated by competition with each other, hmm. meaning that the number, the number of young that they have, the, their, their survival um, and, and adult survival is more linked to how many other coyotes there are in the area than, there, than it is to how many, how many are killed in a year. And so uh, when, there's f when there's fewer coyotes around during denning season, more pups are gonna survive sort of thing. Or when, there's, um, or when they're constantly bumping up against the edges of the territories. And I had collared coyotes where one would get killed and two days later, one of my other collared ones would be in that territory because he'd been checking it out and checking it out and it was a better high resource territory. And as soon as he noticed that guy was gone, Moving he, on he was in it, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's it's called compensatory immigration, and it's it's very quick. It can be very quick with coyotes. But would you agree that if a guy, let's just say we're doing this right before turkeys nest, we're mm -hmm. doing this again right before fawns drop, that if you removed some off the landscape on your farm in your area, you might be helping those hens nesting those on, on in your area. We we don't have any evidence to, for that either way. I used so. to. I have I have one to couple that question. <laughs> so we're forty days from turkey season, so our minds are, are getting yep. there right now. That's all we think about anyway. <laughs> but so, would you rather have a coyote or coyote that helps manage your nest predators like your bobcats or your possums or your coons, or would you rather take that coyote out of the equation? Ooh. That's, I mean, like, that's an interesting question. It's a good trade-off. It's, it's sort of a, um, it's, it's a, it's a hypothetical, right? Because right. yeah, we, we don't, we don't know right now. We don't know, we haven't done the research to be able to tell us at that fine scale, is that actually affecting, um, are, are you actually going to increase? And it's not even just like, are they gone? Right. But it's, does it actually affect nest success in the end? Right. Hmm. And so, um, and there's a lot of factors that contribute to that. Uh, some of it's going to be density, but some of it is going to be just the individuals you have on your land. So we see this a lot when we're dealing more with like livestock um, conflicts with, with coyotes. But you probably, if you have livestock, you're talking about growing up on the edge of a cow pasture, mm -hmm. right? There are coyotes there. Did you always have coyote damage? I, I never it, yeah. remember any coyote damage, yeah. honestly. I Did you remember, have cows? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so, we never had a problem of them eating young or anything yeah. else. It was yeah. just they were always out there singing in the field. Yeah, yeah. So, so coyotes are like people, and this is becoming a really, I mean, all animals have personalities to some degree, and it's becoming a really interesting um, area of research. And I know Dr. Damaris and Dr. Strickland are really interested in how that, uh, mm -hmm. like personalities in deer. Coyotes have personalities too. And so you have some individuals, and we measure that in how bold they are. So some individuals are going to be really bold, and some individuals are going to be more risk averse. Uh, and if you have a risk averse coyote that's maintaining the territory near your pasture, you're probably not going to have damage. If you remove it, you don't know who's moving in. Uh -huh. So we commonly will look at it and be like, it, you, you probably want to first assess that there actually is damage occurring before you just go in and actively trap to remove. If, you're, if your objective is to reduce damage or the potential for damage. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say to extend that to the concept of like, you know, trapping before, I don't think it... I, I don't know if it helps. I also don't know if it hurts, you know. So, so you, one thing you do know, though, mm -hmm. is if you pull one out, you're going to get another one. You back. are. You're not. We In, in all of this time and all of the trapping and effort that everybody's put into trying to decrease coyote populations, they've increased. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, pretty amazing. Yeah. So, really? I mean, it is. You have to respect yeah. them a little bit because no, they're kind of like. <laughs> completely respect them. I mean, you know, hey. 
So what? What on? On is there a preferred food source? I mean, no. Or is it just whatever's out there? Yeah, yeah. They'll eat a cheeseburger if there's a cheeseburger yeah. out there, and they'll eat a rodent if a rodent's yeah. out there. So what I I call it the Roomba hypothesis. You know those little robotic uh, va- vacuums. Like a coyote diet is very representative of whatever is available because they're sense. just moving around the landscape and eating up what's there. I kind of like me. Yeah. So they, <laughs> they eat like uh, you know grasshoppers and cicadas yep. and stuff like that. They too? do, yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. And big cicada years, we see coyote scats with they're just filled with them, yeah. Hmm. So they're just you know they're and and because of that reason too, there there have been there have been people that have tried to argue that they're really helpful for regulating populations, and that's why I'm saying I'm I'm not sure. I can't say. They're not really good at that either, because <laughs> as soon as a prey population, you know, like say you want them to, to, to take out voles, you don't want voles damaging, mm-hmm. you know, some of your some of your resources. Then um, as soon as that vole population drops a little bit, they're probably going to be eating more of something else, right? So the pressure comes back off. So we we don't see them being very good at at regulating prey populations. They just consume them in proportional amounts. You know, right. it's <laughs> if so there's complex. a lot of them, they eat them. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when, uh, like at the very beginning, Rob played those counties yeah. a little late, I might add. <laughs> I love the sound. Sorry. <laughs> so what? What's going on here? What when you hear them howling and all that? What, is there some kind of communication going on? Can you talk us and explain I, about that? I don't speak coyote. I wish I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but but we do know there was a researcher back in the seventies that did a lot of work on vocalizations and was able to identify. I think at the time, eleven distinct vocalizations. Um, they're social animals. They live in families. And so, the, and they cover really large areas um, and they will often share resources, but so they'll go off individually or in pairs and, and hunt. Um, and they will also communicate with the individuals that are the, the other groups that are surrounding them. And so, um, so they have a lot of different ways of communicating, but I thought it was neat that all of you picked up on or had somewhere heard that they can sound like a lot. And, uh, did did you pick? Did you hear why or why we why we think that is? Mm-hmm. Oh, let's. We want to yeah. know. Okay. I was I've based on what Bobby said. Is how I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> how Lanny gets all his information. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. So the hypothesis is that because they they did um, co evolve at the same time as wolves, that and, and in areas where there were or where there were larger canids, that um, it's a defense mechanism. It makes them sound like a larger group. So they seem more intimidating. How about that? Yeah. Well, they certainly do. When they you do. hear them in that, <laughs> it'll yeah. make you pucker up, especially in the morning. I ain't gonna lie <laughs> yeah, about bone it. Bone chilling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really is. And so a lot of what you know, what we're we're doing is in the spring turkey hunt, mm-hmm. walking down some logging roads. Seems like I see a lot of couch cats. Seems yeah. like they like to drop their scat in the road. They do. Yeah, it's great because it means I can send undergrads out with a bag and send them to go collect. <laughs> Just stuff. walk down it's the, the road. Easiest field work in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always a lot of hair in it. Yep. And I'm assuming it's rabbit hair. There's probably a good amount of deer hair in there and some other things, too. Um, I mean, they, whatever, again, whatever is kind of proportionally available, and not even just number of individuals, but you got to think, like, one deer carcass, a coyote could feed on that for quite a long time. And so there might be hair in, in you know, 20 or 40 scats that are all coming from the same deer, right? Or um, what's nice with rodents is you can, like, that's that's one, right? You see one, you, if mm-hmm. I find a vole skull in a, in a scat, that's one one mortality. But deer has been a really tough one to nail down how, me, how much the, they actually depredate versus, and even versus scavenge. Um, that's, that's something that we're still really having a hard time nailing down. So, so you, I think you mentioned DNA earlier, yeah. or maybe I was reading it in one of your abstracts, but, uh, so can you take a, a part, a scat piece of scat and figure out that that was three or four deer based on DNA? We're working on it. Okay. So, so the answer is that we, we tried it with microsatellites, um, and we, we can kind of, so the more, you've got two levels of degradation for the DNA there, right? So the first time is that the DNA is, um, it, it goes through the gut of the coyote, right? And then it gets left out in the environment where it degrades even further in the coyote scat. So each, each one of those steps makes it a little harder to amplify it correctly. Um, and so we call that low quality, uh, low quantity DNA. And uh, so we've got it worked out for microsatellites, but it's not amplifying as well. And we're for a certain type of, um, of DNA analysis or sequencing, um, but it's not working as well as we hope. So we're moving to another step. But that is that is something that's in the works. Yeah, we're, we're trying. I'd love to get that stuff. answer. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of the research that you were involved in and collaring coyotes and what you learned and what you saw that might have been interesting and 
at the town. Yeah, I mean, what I think I think the one of the most interesting things really was when we put collars on these animals that their home ranges could could be so large. Um, I think another was we we generally researchers when like for statistical reasons we try not to collar individuals that are in the same territory because uh, we're trying to get independent samples. So we'll try you know we'll trap in one area and then once we catch one we'll move to another area to try to get into another another home range. Um, but we managed to trap a male and female that ended up being the same pair. Just they happen to be in different spots when we trapped them. Um, and what was really neat to me was just how much all of their points aligned. Like they were really, they were, they, they moved together pretty consistently. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty neat. Cause I kind of always imagined it as like teamwork. Like you take this area, like they cover so much area to like defend their territory. Um, but I thought that was pretty neat. Um, what else? Just that, uh, that they could, you know, that they could occur at such low densities when people were so convinced that there were a lot of them. Like, so, you know, the, the person that I trap with is a, now a PhD student at Virginia Tech following up on my research. We, we expanded that study from just coyotes to looking at coyotes, bears, and bobcats, and then impacts to deer. And, um, and so he and I were both coming from Colorado to trap, and we were coming from trapping bobcats on the same project. And we went out to Virginia, and we're driving around and we're seeing, and everybody's telling us, oh, there's so many coyotes here. It's going to be super easy to, to trap. And we're driving around and we're seeing outdoor cats. And we're like, oh, this is going to be so much harder than we think it is. <laughs> because we, if, if there's outdoor cat activity, then then you know there's not a lot of coyotes around because they, 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 would eat them. they will eat them. <laughs> so that was a, um, so yeah, so that was when we started realizing that they, that the perception of the population size can be so drastically different than the tr than the reality of it. And it was really just that these animals were just moving around so much to have to get the food they needed. Hmm. What are what is a large territory? Can, I mean, so the ones in the ones in that re in that research area, I got to do kilometers to square miles. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah, I think ten to twenty square miles. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they really. And then when you think about transients, like that was pretty cool too. Is that we, you know, you, when you trap and put when you trap an animal and put a collar on it, you don't know if it's going to be a resident or if it's going to be what we call transients. And transients are individuals that um, that don't have an established ter like a, a traditional established territory. And usually it's a younger individual that's been kicked out of its home range, its natal range where it was born, but it hasn't been able to pick up a territory yet. And this is where that compensatory immigration comes from a lot. So they would actually, we'd, we'd have animals that would run um, 40 or 50 miles, uh, you know, across a distance, but they'd be working their way around the territories of the, the edges of the territories of these other animals. And then once one of them died, they drop in. So once of them, one of them was removed, they just drop right in. So that's, I mean, that's what you're up against if you're trying to actually reduce the population size. It's, it's. There, there, there's, so there's a constant roamers. source of yeah. rumors, yeah. And so that's that's one of the papers is looking at. We called it. It's it's different than a. It's it's kind of a different dynamic. So one of Mike Chamberlain's grad students at the time, Joey Hinton, was. Um, uh, he and I were both grad students at the same time and, and spent a lot, a lot of time talking about it. It's different than just what we think about as our regular transients, which are usually just subordinate individuals that don't have a home range. They're really in a biting state, right? Like so, they're individuals that are just waiting for a. Bit. Like you might even have an established territory, but it's just not a very good one. And you're just waiting, you're biding your time until another one opens up and then they'll move over into that. So, so there's different levels of transience that can kind of um, facilitate this constant rollover of territories. It sounds like they're going to be a, around for a very, very long time. They are. But the good news is, I mean, outside of maybe, you know, particular times, the good news is what we found is that you can manage habitat to, to improve your, like, or to decrease the effect they have on resources. So, um, yeah, so habitat management will, one, one of the really neat studies um, that was done, it's Will Gulsby at Auburn um, did it with data, but that was John Kilgo's data from South Carolina. And they had done this fawn study where they looked at, they'd, they'd done fawn survival, um, they had incredibly low fawn survival the first year, it went back up after a couple of years, and uh, they they did the study and they they looked at it and they took nuds boards they did all the vegetation sampling right at the spot where the fawn was 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 bedding and then looked at fawn survival and they said there is no relationship whatsoever you know like so there's no there's no way to tell or to to tell what you could do to improve the habitat quality for fawns um, and then we uh, you know in talking about it with other people they realized that if you take it out to a larger um, 
a larger scale, we, we shouldn't be looking at it necessarily at the scale of the fawn. We should be looking at the scale of the predator. So if you take it out and look at that, you see that, that they, they found, they took it out to the scale of the, the doe at that point, I think, and then found a relationship. So the more heterogeneity, the more complexity in the habitat, the greater the survival probability for the fawns, right? So if you had just like this, um, you know, uh, plantation style kind of uh, habitat, then they, then they, you're going to have lower survival. But if you had all these kind of mixed stands, then that was that really improved your ability. So, Different stages of succession. Exactly. Yes. But, yeah. Yeah. That that's interesting. Yeah. So oftentimes when I'm hunting, I'll see one single cow yeah you know by itself is that one part of i know not i'm really not asking about yeah. one specific but would that would as a general rule would they be part of a pack but then he just goes off hunting by himself it, yeah i would say probability wise that more individuals are in family groups than are transients but it could also be a transient yeah. so yeah so a, a couple of years ago i was my daughter was just kind of getting into bow hunting mm -hmm. and we um Climbed up in a two-person ladder stand together, but real quiet one afternoon. And there was some sunshine kind of hitting about 100 yards from us. And I kept seeing something really light-colored over there. And I got my binoculars out and was looking at it. And it was a coyote. 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 One of those three <laughs> that was laying there, curled up just like, yeah. a, like a cat, yep. laying there asleep. Yeah. Like and, a coyote. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I had, uh, of course, I had, you know, she had a... A bow, but so we just sat there and what, and he slept and slept and slept, yep. and then about an hour before dark, he got up and stretched just yeah. like a dog, yep. and then t -t -t -t, he was gone. Yeah, yeah, they're they're neat. There are times I've had a few where I've snuck up on them, or like when you're upwind and they don't you, they don't know you're there, and you can really get some good observations. Um, I, you know, like just even sneaking up on them when all of a sudden they realize you're there and they, you know, alert off and, you know, like it's it's amazing. But one of my favorites was actually, and this is when I really started thinking about like, how good are they really going to be at taking adult de adult deer down? So this was in Southern California and I was across a canyon and I saw um, a coyote, like I was I was running and checking trail cams, but I saw a coyote across the, the um, canyon and there was a mule deer, a pregnant mule deer, very pregnant mule deer. And he was kind of dancing around her. And so I stopped, and I squatted down, and I got my binoculars out. And I watched it for about, I don't know, almost 10 minutes, trying to, like, just dance around with this, this very pregnant mule deer. And, um, and he kept trying to, like, push her in one direction. He kept trying to back her in one direction. Uh, or I say he, it. Um, uh, and then, and eventually, she kind of stomped, and it was a steep canyon. And she kind of got close to him a couple times, and he just took off. Or, and, and, and he kind of backed off, and then she was able to, to take off. And after that, another coyote where he was trying to push her in was 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 came back out, and the two of them ran off together. But it was you know it was like that cooperative attempt, and that should have been a pretty easy. If you're an effective predator, that should be an easy kill. Um, but they're so small relative to adult deer that adult deer are one very dangerous to them in reality, and two their jaw size, their the the um, the actual like mandible width. Is, is so narrow that like the, the, to be able to really get a hold, they're not very effective. Um, so they kind of have to hamstring them and it's, it takes a while, right? Like, so they're gonna be good on adult deer that are already injured or maybe, you know, like one that you've shot that you've lost track of or something like that. Or one that's been, you know, when I'd go, you know, when I'd be out in the woods and I'd see a, a deer limping from maybe like a vehicle injury, I was like, okay, that, that's that's coyote bait, you know? But mm -hmm. um, but like a healthy adult deer is not, is not really gonna be a worry. Um, so where you're going to see the most mortality is going to be what, like you said, fawns, and then and then picking off the injured. So, yeah. Wow. Mac, have you got a question? So when it comes to back to the habitat, what would you say, like in in the southeast, is a perfect habitat for coyote? Oh well, they like anything, <laughs> but they overall they like more open areas, or they tend to do well in more open areas. And they tend to, they, they're, we call the, the word's called thigmatic. They tend to work the edges of habitats. Um, I think my working hypothesis on why having more habitat diversity in a, in a, like in an area decreases or increases survival of, of fawns is because they're spending more time working it. Like they have to, you know, like as opposed to, they're coursing predators. If you have a ton of dirt roads running down, like bisecting an area, they can just put their nose in the air and fly up and down and and hit that. So I think they like really open areas because they're they're 
they're running, they're trotting and they're picking up scents and then they're going for things. Whereas the more kind of structure you have, the, the more difficult that makes it for them. Do you think that uh, feeders or bait sites, uh, that coyotes use those uh, in their predator ways? You know, I don't know if it's been specifically studied. I can't imagine they wouldn't. Uh, but that is strictly just my opinion. Um, but there's there's no way to me they wouldn't pick up on something like that. They know I, there was a there was a coyote in Southern California in Los Angeles that would hang out at the dump and wait for the garbage trucks to leave every morning, and then he would follow one of the garbage trucks around and just eat the garbage that fell out of it. He just, you know like they're they're gonna go they're they're lazy dogs. They're gonna go for what is easy for them to obtain. And so yeah, if you're if you're concentrating a lot of food in one area or a lot of potential prey in one area, I can't imagine they wouldn't pick up on that. So you know, most of the time when you see a coyote, they're <clears throat> they're jogging. I, yeah. I, I guess I mean that you never see one just. I, I don't. I mean, yeah. It seems like they're always moving. Fast. Is that a? Why is that? Most canids trot. Yeah, uh, yeah. We call that gait a trot. Um, whereas, like, they're because they're not. They're not like ambush predators, right? So you think about mountain lions or bobcats. Those are ambush predators. They're gonna. You're gonna have a really stealthy walk. Um, but coyotes just. Tend, they, that's just their efficient form of locomotion. So that's. <laughs> they, they, Wow. Yeah. They just kind of bounce around. Yeah, I mean, you, typically around here, if you see one, it's only for a few seconds, it yeah. seems like. Oh, yeah. But they're always trotting. Yeah, seems. on yeah. the move. Big yeah. bushy tails. And if they see you, they trot faster. Oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> So, no, that's that's true. That and the only time I haven't seen them trotting when they're not, you know, when I haven't trapped them, is when they're engaging with something totally novel and they're figuring it out, right? But even then, they kind of dance around it more than they, yeah. How's their swimming? Uh, probably pretty good. I think I um, I don't think any different than a dog. I can't imagine, right? Like that's they're they're built <laughs> pretty much sense. the same. Yeah, we know they swim back and forth across rivers and things like that. So do the bears. I mean, that's the uh, um, but so yeah, they they can easily get across pretty pretty big waterways. So yeah. so what about uh, I guess other than people, uh -huh. hunters. <laughs> Would would the heartworms affect them like they do our our dogs? So Ooh, good oh, question. nice, Bobby. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's there has been some research into it. I would say yes, but heartworm takes longer to kill coyotes than most coyotes or kill you know an average canid than most coyotes live. Ah, that so would make sense. most coyotes are only live in three to four years anyway, at, at least in a harvested population. You'll get individuals that reach like eight years old. But when you look at like a heavily, like where you're actively trapping, actively hunting, your population, your adults are probably three to four years old on average. Hmm. That's a tough life. Yeah. Well, you should see them by that point too. Their teeth are all broken. Their tails are all like, are, are, they, they really beat each other up pretty yeah. good. Well, they don't get to go to the vet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No heart guard. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, and, and so, and occasionally you'll see, like, you'll hear of a rabid coyote. There was one, I think, up in um, Westchester County, New York, maybe um, two years ago. But it's pretty, pretty rare. I mean, I'm vaccinated for rabies for, you know, for, for handling just in just case. Just in case. Yeah. But, but it's pretty rare that you see that. You don't see them. We don't think they get affected by, I, I haven't seen any reason to think they get affected by distemper the way that foxes do. Like foxes, you'll see that cyclical boom and bounce. And, and that's really usually distemper outbreaks that are driving that. But, um, but coyotes, um, I think, I mean, really, it's hard to say that anything would be a major cause of mortality when they're being, you know, the, the probability in, in, in my study area where there was only, you know, there, there weren't that many coyotes to begin with, the probability of them being harvested every year was one in three. So imagine a one in three chance of making it every year to the next year. Um, the, the disease aspect is going to be pretty minor compared to that. Wow. So you're saying, when you say harvested, you're talking about a hunter or a trapper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that seems like pretty good odds. I mean, I, I, one like, three. I mean, I would. I mean, it makes me feel like we're doing a pretty good as a hunter. We're they were very effective. We put out so so. Imagine me. I'm you know coming from coming from California, moving to Appalachia. I was gonna get, get, go do my PhD on coyotes, and we put the first six collars out, and five of them came back to me within like a month. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> it made me feel like I wasn't gonna get my PhD. <laughs> so, but the uh, it, it changed the focus of my study in a way that I that is really. 
um, guided my career since then. Because it went from being a habitat study to being a more like a study on population dynamics and mortality. Hmm. And so that was that was really neat. And by you know, it could not be anything else. But it was, but that was neat. Um, and I actually ended up skinning all the coyotes. I got uh, almost all the coyotes. I put collars on that were shot or trapped. Um, the, the the people that had them, I put my number on them, and they'd call me, and I'd come collect them. Um, and I actually ended up skinning all the coyotes and then making gifts of them to uh, people on my committee and people that helped me and landowners. And That's so they're cool. neat. They've got the ear tags in them and they're just like a nice coyote skin. Oh, I cool. notice you guys don't have any coyote skins. We need here. one. I'm going to have to work on that for you. I don't guess no, we do. No, we don't. No, I'm going to work on that for we'll you. Get one, that's so. for sure. Yeah. No, Mac, hey, well, all right. once Mac asks a question, it's... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, the, it's spinning right now. That's so, right. So kind of back to the disease aspect, uh -huh. uh, I guess us having a kennel here, I always think about puppies and then you always think about parvo. Does that affect coyotes? Do coyotes spread parvo? And then I guess my second question would be, Whenever you see a, a mange coyote or a, a mangy coyote, mm -hmm. what what causes that? They definitely do get mange, so they can absolutely get mange. Um, I don't know to what degree it affects populations, probably, again, for the same reason. Um, for parvo, I don't know, but I can find out for you. But I can't – I haven't seen anything on it. It doesn't mean that people haven't done that research, but um, I don't – just based on the amount that I was forced to read about coyotes in the process of getting my dissert, uh, getting my PhD, uh, to not ha to not have any recollection of that, I don't think that it's probably that it's at least at that time was identified as a major source. So, but I can't yeah. imagine they wouldn't get it. I just don't know that, you you know, different. They're called incompetent hosts. You know, like different animals might not transmit it very well, or it might not stick very well. Yeah, Lanny, you got a question? Yeah, I stepped out for a minute, but I did want to ask. Um, as far as when they're hunting or when they're looking for food, and y'all might have already asked this when I was out, but uh, so if you have, we can pass See if I on. say the same thing. Say yeah. thing. <laughs> Would, uh, is it more like a scavenging kind of a thing, or is it more like a hunting kind of thing? It's going to be both. Okay. So if you've ever seen a coyote go, like when they we call it mousing, mm -hmm. it's amazing. They will they will stand right over a burrow and they will wait until and th their ears are so sensitive, same as foxes. Their ears are so sensitive and they're picking up the vibrations of the animals underneath. And as soon as it pops up, they jump straight up into the air, arch over entirely into like this extreme U shape. And then they're just down, their nose down in that burrow on them. Mm -hmm. um, so they definitely have adaptations for types of burrowing and or for types of hunting. And again, they they have this kind of coursing predation strategy where they're running, they're covering as much area as they can with their nose in the air with this really sensitive nose to try to pick up um, easy prey. Um, but they will also scavenge intensively. Huh. So, you know, like they're, they're animals that have lived entirely in garbage dumps. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it just yeah. seems like when they're, you know, trotting and running, that's with their head up in there, it's like what yeah. they're doing. I don't yeah. know. But then they catch a scent and maybe go there and check that out. And, yeah. Well, and all of us have, maybe shot a quick a, bite. have shot a deer in the, in the evening and, yeah. and maybe had the blood trail. And, and when you finally got there, there was a hind quarter was eating mm -hmm. out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, is I think they pick up, I mean, like, you have to imagine if you're really eking out an existence that you, you, you get pretty good at different things. But we always had, um, we always got excited when we'd, we'd, we'd try to set traps near areas where maybe where we there, there had been a carcass down or something like that to try to increase our chances of of capture real quick and uh, we'd always get excited when the vulture showed up because it was pretty huh. telling once the vulture showed up we were going to catch a coyote like the next day and we think they were keen in on the vultures because believe me do you know them. vultures actually have a better sense of smell than canines oh well, i wonder how no. they smell stuff that's for sure <laughs> they do so 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 we found that the vultures tend to show up first and then after that we start catching do you think they're watching the vultures? Or I do. I think. I think. I don't know. I think. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, we do. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. dogs that yeah. look up at yeah. vultures and bark. Yeah. You know, they have good eyes. Yeah. You, you know, a dog ducks. that looks up at a vulture and barks. <laughs> I, I actually do. <laughs> Yeah, my, well, my look, buddy right, Evans. We got dog. two. We got yeah. two. <laughs> Hate Co it. copper doesn't bark at bark at vultures. He does, we have buzzards around. Do we have vultures around here? Bobby. Here we go. Okay. Well. Coyote. 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 <laughs> okay, right, right, right. Yeah. I'm going to get some tacos um, around here. Come on, Dudley. You got a question. Oh, Margarita is so, even better. You know, yep. the, everybody listening, uh, the majority of us are all big deer and turkey hunters uh, and more. Um, and they want to know, you know, since science can't prove that, that trapping can lower the population to have, you know, better hatches or whatever deer and turkeys um 
What are some things you can do on a landscape scale that is, I mean, obviously habitat. Yeah, it's habitat. But <laughs> can we go deeper into that a little bit? You know, like you admit, we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Uh, patchy habitat or, or big areas of, you know, early succession, big area. Yeah. Uh, late succession, big area. Or is it a bunch of small places outlined by fire lanes that i mean you know. I, I would yeah. go the opposite of that so that's, that's the one we figured out in virginia is that there were there were areas where they'd opened up and they'd done small like couple acre clover fields in this like sea of barrenness and all of the deer congregated there and all the coyotes hung mm, out there right um so uh, yeah i would say the more the more diversity of structure you can give it the better and the more undercover you can get, get it you can give it that the better what's nice is that or what 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 i find encouraging is i've also been working on the turkey project for mdw doing the um, demographic modeling for them um, and doing projections of and it's kind of like these what if scenarios so I create these um, using using um, using numbers from studies previous studies I create populations of turkeys and then we say well what if we move the season back two weeks what would we expect to happen to the population what if we um, what if we increase the bag limit or decrease the bag limit what would we expect to happen and then I th just threw in there a little one and I said well what if we increased the number of potential nest sites by 2%. And mm. it outdid all of the other measures. So really? by a lot. Yeah. So so it's habitat, like all of that just goes back to again. And this is very rarely will you get a carnivore biologist saying that it's the yeah. habitat. <laughs> yeah. Because most of the time we're saying carnivores are important because they regulate populations and they drive ecosystem dynamics. And truthfully, in this case, when you're talking about at least these two game species, it's the habitat. So if you can increase um, brooding habitat, you're going to increase your number of turkeys on your landscape, regardless of what the predators are there. So, so, so when I think about it in terms of, and I'm not saying that tra doing some trapping is going to be, is going to harm it or is going to, is, isn't going to have some effect. It's just a much smaller effect compared to what you do when you improve your habitat. Hmm. Habitat first. Habitat, habitat first. first. Yeah. Then that, have fun. We knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but it's if, it, to hear have somebody yeah. explain it like that. Yeah, in the right way. It makes a lot it's more sense. It's kind of like my, my parents would make me come home and do my homework first, and then I could go out and play. Well, yeah. the, the habitat's your homework. Yeah, yeah. go get it Once you get first. your homework done, then you can start playing. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah, so if you're doing really good habitat management and you want to go out and trap, and uh, you, you'll probably get a little extra bump out of that. Mm -hmm. But if you're not doing good habitat management to begin with, with, the trapping's not going to get you anywhere. So, yeah, that's it. Hmm. Yeah. So, could you take just a minute mm -hmm. and kind of go back in time to? I think it's around the mid to late eighteen hundreds when the the government decided, okay, we're going to get rid of all these predators, yeah. and kind of talk our audience through what happened during, I, I think, forty or fifty years of attempting to do that. Well, they managed, yeah, so there was a massive predator campaign. Actually, Aldo Leopold, who wrote Sand County Almanac, was one of the trappers doing that. He was, uh, he, that was one of his first jobs was moving predator removal. Um, and, uh, prompted a lot of his, his later thinking about the land ethic. Um, yeah, there was a massive campaign to, to dominate the landscape and remove all predators. And so what, what they were successful at removing was large predators. Uh, they were not as successful at, at removing medium-sized predators because they just have this kind of feedback mechanism, like like coyotes, where they can they can compensate with reproduction and with um, and with uh, um, immigration. And so uh, we changed the predator dynamics across most of the East. We now have kind of a me what we call a meso predator landscape. So our largest predators in Mississippi are black bears and and coyotes. And they're not very large. They're, like in, when you think about that compared to mountain lions or wolves or, you know, like tigers or something like that, they're not very effective apex predators. And so we don't really know what's going on. Um, we're, we're, we're still learning how that changes predator prey dynamics because you're dealing with just a different system that, than what's natural or what, what, what has than what it evolved under. Hmm. So. Yeah, I just find it fascinating that that uh, there was <clears throat> such an attempt to just change the whole way the landscape looked, yeah. and, and and I can understand it, cattle farmers and whatnot, and wolves. I I see that being a problem, and, and 
but it, they well, really... wolves are scary. I'll tell you, like I like I love canids. I like working with them, and and uh, I think wolves are fantastic. But I mean, do I want them in my backyard necessarily? No. <laughs> it's like yeah. Are are you hearing a lot in urban areas of coyotes coming up on people's back porches and snatching cats? And so when I was in California, <laughs> I heard cats. it regularly. Yeah, and they and and unfortunately, there were also a couple incidences where they'd come and they and and even take try to take a child out of somebody's hands. Oh. Um, and all of that we can relate back to habituation, right? Right? So uh, what we would say is a fed coyote is a dead coyote. Um, if you're feeding inadvertently or intentionally feeding coyotes in your neighborhood, then you're training a coyote to s associate humans with an easy food resource. And they're not going to differentiate between the hot dog in your hand and somebody else is holding, holding their child. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's truly a danger to be, to be feeding wildlife in the, or predators in that way. It's the same is true for bears. We're going to run up against this as the bear population starts to recover in Mississippi, that feeding, f f associating humans with food resources ultimately leads to two things. One is some some form of attack or, or some form of damage, including um, killing pets, and two, that animal then being killed because of it. So, mm. um, so yeah, so fed, fed coyotes, fed bears, those are, those are future dead animals. But all of the, every one of the, up until I left in 2008, it left San Diego, um, all of the attacks could be linked back to... Um, to those animals having been fed by humans, so it's it's truly a human issue more so than they're not gonna they're not gonna learn to come up there and like like I said, some animals are bold, some are risk averse, but none of them are crazy, right? <laughs> so like right. they have to be they got to be trained to, they got to be trained to be brought up there. Um, there is one um, one exemption I can think of since then, uh, and that was a really extreme situation, um, and that was in. Canada and Cape Breton, um, where a young woman um, was run down and, and killed by coyotes and Good and, grief. and eaten by them. Yeah, it was uh, twenty. I want to say twenty ten, maybe. It was very tragic, and it was very. It, it really shocked all of us in the coyote world yeah. because we just couldn't even imagine that happening. And when they've they've just finally gotten the final research out of it, they went and looked. They did. Um, they took whiskers from the animals and they did stable isotopes to look at their diet. And what they found was that those animals were existing almost exclusively on moose meat at that time. And that and coyotes cannot kill a moose. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so they were scavenging dead moose when, when available. And the reason they were doing that, the reason they it wasn't they they'd chosen to specialize on scavenging dead moose, we don't think. It was that the resources, the, the small mammal populations had just crashed in the area. And so, um, so if you're really hungry, your aversion to risk might change, right? And so, so those animals had become very bold um, because they were essentially starving. So, um, so we wouldn't expect to see that a lot more. But what's interesting about that to me, when I think about that, and when I think about some incidents that have occurred out west with black bears attacking humans, um, is that that resource change really seems to have an effect in how aggressive animals are willing to be or how mm -hmm. how risky they'll start to behave. Um, and so that's something that we can start to look at, right? we can we can be more aware in in times when we know that um, that it's a a bad mast year or a bad crop or a bad or or small mammal populations are crashing or things like that. So. So was this person just taking a stroll through the woods? She was and, hiking, yeah. Yep. And and a pack of coyotes attacked her. It was her two of them. Her. Two of them, yeah. I'll tell you what, Kyle better pack his lunch coming over here. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was it was. It was tragic, but it was it was incredibly unusual and that's yeah. what makes it stick out and and um and makes you really want to learn from it. So, yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Wow. Unusual. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Dudley, you got anything else? Or? De uh, Dudley has spent hours preparing for this, and, oh, I'm so and I could hear him in his <laughs> office, and he'd say, "She is so interesting. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, she did that." Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really am surprised. Uh, you know, we got Dr. Chamberlain, and all. You know, you're yeah, and w when you leave, he'll be, "Oh, I wish I had asked her." <laughs> so, so Dudley, I'm gonna give you a couple th seconds to think about something. So, Lady, what are you looking? I just think it's really interesting how she came. Oh, again, we've been talking about coyotes and coyotes and coyotes and whatever you want to call them. Uh, but then she came back to something that was always central as his gamekeepers, just habitat first. You know mm. what I mean? So it's uh, very interesting stuff. And I, I got a lot of respect for the coyote. I mean, it's a uh, highly adaptable, you know, it's a survivor. Um, you know, so you got to have, got to have, got to give him his props. Yeah. And it is, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of normal now to see them. 
Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and to hear them, yeah. you hear them a lot of, a lot of evenings, it seems like. And, and it seems like one will sound off and then you'll hear another one will answer them a little yeah. ways away. Ooh, about like that. So I've always wondered if they were trying to get together or they're just trying to see. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes it could be. It could be that they've made a kill and they're alerting the others in the pack, but it could oh, so be them share. saying. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it could also be them saying, them saying like, hey, back off. You mm-hmm. know, like if it's a different, two different groups. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I'd say we see them often, you know. We, we see them regularly around here for sure. Yeah. We were talking it before you came on air. Uh, can we get into like their coloration a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so the, what's what's neat is that so western coyotes are pretty much all this tawny sandy color, and then during that expansion, two different things happened. Um, so there was the northern expansion that came down around the Great Lakes and through the Adirondacks and the and Maine, and then there was the southern expansion that came across the south. And these two things were happening in, independently. The southern front actually, we what we what we've been able to figure out with the genetics is that that southern front, we get, we'll get we get what we call melanistic, but black coyotes yeah. in the east. Um, and then we'll get a really interesting range of like mostly reds and blondes in there. But I've caught like strawberry blonde. I've caught like almost pure white. Um, I'd catch the, the melanistic black ones with like mantles, like wolverines. I've caught one that looks almost like a red fox. It's so red and it had almost the light markings kind of like by the nose and the tail. Um, so you get these really fantastic color pelage variations with, um, with coyotes in the east. And f- that's coming in from, like, it's a consequence of them, of an expanding population. So as they were expanding across the south, if you imagine you're an individual and you move out to an area where there's no other individuals like you, uh, much like the positive assortment or, or the, the wolves deciding, oh, I'll, I'll tolerate a coyote, coyotes were saying, like, I'll tolerate a dog. So, uh, so huh. that melanistic gene, that, that, that the black coyotes, that's a little tiny bit of dog DNA in there huh. that's causing that. And then, um, the, the other colors that we're getting, and, and probably some of the other, the other colors we're getting too. And then, but then we also know they're melanistic wolves. And so from the North, um, we're getting that same pattern. So the, it's the individuals coming from the North, but that was what was fantastic about being in like what we call the convergence zone in, in Virginia and, and North Carolina is when you were trapping, you got, you, I mean, like you never knew what color what coyote you're going to get. And, yeah. Well, we see a lot of black ones. Yeah. Of course, I, you know, I've had black labs for 20 years. Maybe they're mingling with yeah. the population. <laughs> yeah. you can't ever tell. What is Goose doing? What is they, Goose doing yeah. out there? Yeah, out there yapping with them. <laughs> so, you know, I've never seen them. I've seen, seen photos of black cows, yeah. but I think I would have to look at it pretty I mean, you can, a cow is pretty easy to tell. It's yeah, a cow the way that, that face yeah. and the tail yeah. kind of hangs down yeah. a bit. But. And they're fuzzy, puffy. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the ear length and the, the down tail is always for me the, the easiest. Like as soon as I see it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a coyote. But it's interesting because we had a hypothesis. When I said five of the six that I collared, they first collared got returned pretty quickly. The sixth one was melanistic. And so, huh. and there are collars where we called them desert camo because the collar company that we used in Africa, like painted them to be like coyote color, but they were just like a, a, a beige <laughs> color, but they, but they blended in more with some of the lighter colored coyotes. And so, so we had a hypo- we had a working hypothesis that the, that the black one that was, was running around, it was a transient. It was really covering a lot of ground. Um, we had a hypothesis that it was, uh, people thought, thought it was a collared dog. And so they weren't shooting it. And then I started talking to some guys that ran a state, um, a, a wildlife management area in West Virginia. And they were like, you're the one who collared the black coyote. We couldn't shoot. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and what it was is that she was a transient. She was moving. She was the one covering like 40 to 50 miles every two weeks. Um, and she was, she, the, it was that they'd see her, they'd go out to try, you know, like they, they, they get her on a game camera and they're assuming she's got a territory there. And she was long gone by the time they were going out to try mm-hmm. to hunt her. So, uh, so it was more a function of like her stature than it was the actual color that was protecting her. But. Interesting. Do y'all remember Glenn Garner? There was a, a coyote, coyote. 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 Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, my, I just lost my headset. I don't, okay, there it's it. still on your head. So, so there was one on uh, Jeff Foxworthy's farm uh, in, in that area, and yeah. Glenn talked about there. Uh, there's there's a river. I think it's the Chattahoochee River. That's not far from there. But they talked about there was a coyote that had a collar on that wouldn't swim the river, but would cross it regularly on a bridge. Oh hmm. yeah, they'll absolutely yeah they they'll cross the there. I remember there's this like fantastic picture, um, ten or twenty years ago of a coyote on the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, like they they why wouldn't they use a yeah. bridge? Yeah, <laughs> I can run across this thing a lot yeah. faster than I can swim. Yeah. So one other thing that 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 interested me about this was the the um, the 
Native Americans out west. Mm-hmm. They revered the yeah. coyote. Now, now, did they think he was sneaky or evil or crafty, or what was their thoughts on him? I'm not an uh, I'm not a cultural anthropologist, but they. I mean, his name was the trickster, right? Like so. But I think it was very much like like we've been kind of talking about. You have to kind yeah. of revere the. Yeah, you have some sort of maybe they knew they were wasting yeah. their time. Yeah, yeah. I don't um, know if if you've ever spent a lot of time trying to catch them. Safe capture, like trying to catch them when you're not trying to injure them, is a, a different beast. Like there's there's a lot of things you have to do to to make sure you're catching uh, when you're when you're trying to catch them safe. Uh, and um, and they, I cussed them out plenty of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they there was one that we trapped, and and, and he, so I I so my. So the, the person I was trapping with, Robert, he had set the foothold that we caught this one in, but I was the one who came across him in the trap. And so I uh, I worked him up, and I spent about 30 minutes kind of sitting on him and everything. Um, and then— Wait a but, minute now. Describe sitting on him. <laughs> I'll send you pictures. Yeah, no, we we don't. We just when you when you, you throw a blanket over. Him I or do. Something? Yeah. Okay. Actually, it's a sheet with pink and, and blue flowers on it. Oh, cool. <laughs> nice. Because it was just fun. Um, it was actually the cheapest one at Walmart when we went looking for one. Right. So, um, but the, uh, um, we yeah we we throw a sheet on them and then we either use a catch pole and then um, pin them down to the ground and then get your head you get your hands on the head and the shoulders and then a knee on them and you can then muzzle them and, and hog tie them up from there. Um, or, yeah, sometimes we just throw a sheet on them and roll them up like a burrito and then pin them down and un- unwrap them. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I bet they don't like that. Do they? They, they don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen folks removing them from a trap, yeah. and they, they seem to just uh, kind of give in. It depends you, on the personality. Okay. Again. I have one. I've got about eight minutes of video that'll be like the blooper reel for my retirement party one day. <laughs> but uh, but I'd actually he was he was so difficult to get, and I'd been doing it for years at that point. But he it took me three minutes to catch, pull him, and get him down on the ground. He fought me the entire time. I was collaring him, bagging. I, you know, we put him in a burlap bag. We weigh them. We do pull blood, do everything, and uh, fought me the entire time. And then when I find like and when and when you're getting ready to release him. You know, you get your knee on them, you get the head and the shoulders again, and you knock the muzzle off and you get the, the feet untied and then you push back and jump back as fast as you can. And they'll usually maybe snap at you a little as they're running away. This guy refused to leave. And he sat for like eight minutes just snarling and growling and howling at me. So I've got some great vocalizations. Like, um, hey, hey, man. Hey, wait, wait. What just happened I here? just freed you. Did what are you, you doing? Did you do that to me? That's, that's why I'm, I'm in there. I'm like, you, I sound like a child in there going like, come on, you're free. Go, run away. Because I had other traps to check. Yeah. yeah. And then and then he's howling. He sees his eyes go back in his head and he's looking around. And, and then I don't remember saying it, but I it's in the video. And all of a sudden you hear me like click in my head and go, who are you talking to? Yeah. <laughs> so after yeah. all those encounters with yeah. coyotes and you've got that sin all over you, when you go home and I think you probably have dogs, well, I bet they freak out. So I've had different reactions from different dogs. I had a, my, my, my dog, uh, my, my, Two dogs ago, she she would pee on my trapping pants, like if I wasn't careful. Like I'd have to come home and immediately. Oh the, no, you yeah, didn't! Immediately yeah. the car hearts went in the wash. Um, my current dog would nest in them if I wasn't. <laughs> like if I left them on the floor, I'd find her like rolling in them. Like she yeah. just loved the scent. Yeah, hmm. so, interesting. Yeah, yeah when I've uh, couple, I've killed a couple cops yeah. this season, and when I would get home, he would just like just glue to me, yeah. smelling my pants. Yep. Yep. It's yeah. My cousin. Uh, so <laughs> after years of trapping do you have any tips for trappers uh, like yeah know? um it's funny we just did my class we just did freestanding neck snares um I, it's just experience right i mean they're gonna they're gonna outsmart you sometimes yeah. so like i i think the the most important thing is to be really patient both in when you're putting your sets in um, really, really solid. Cause once you've, once they've learned what your set looks like and they, who knows what they pick up on that one I was talking about, I, I, uh, you know, Robert had set the trap. I was, uh, I'd worked it up that coyote. Cause we, we collared him and we'd follow him around. And like every few days we'd find one of my traps and there'd just be a big dump next to it. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh-huh. That's and, old Dana's right there. I know. And then we, her what's up. <laughs> we'd go back and look at the collar data cause it was GPS collars. Uh, and we'd go on the computer and look at the collar data and there he was, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know just like he'd picked up on my scent yeah. or something about like, there was something he had figured out and it was just mm. like, I know you were here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let you know I was here. So and for, they do. For yeah. like a beginner, where would be a, a good site or site type, uh, 
so, road intersections. Like, okay. yeah, road yeah. intersections are good spots because they, they really are. They're lazy dogs. They're running. If you've got a bunch of, a bunch of uh, you know, like um, cut roads through, through an area, they're running up and down them. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing I'd say that I think people might, is that you want a lot of a variety in your sets. Like I never set the same set in the same areas. And I never, I tried not to use the same scents in the same area, the same lures, um, because you, what works for one might not work for another. Like they're just, again, there's like such a diversity in personalities, but also because if they bust you on one, then, you know, like if, yeah. if something goes wrong, then you, then you still got a chance on another. Um, I, I usually had, a, I had a, a, like a, it was like a tackle box, but it was all just different lures and scents. Um, and I did get busted once. It was, uh, that was fun. Um, it was, it was like three, I'd caught a coyote at this one spot that I love trapping this one spot because it was just like such high activity. Um, and I needed an easy win. We'd had, I think I'd, I'd had one pull out of a snare and I was like, I was like, I'm going to go set, I'm going to go set at this spot up on um, uh, Knob Hill and then, and, and I'm going to catch. And, uh, and I went and I sent that and I used my favorite, there's a gland lure that I love that, um, that I, that I, and I put it on there and I, I love doing a busted log cause they have to like poke out a little, little bit and they have to work the set a little bit and, um, put the, put my favorite gland lure on there and, uh, it came out and, and there was just tracks all around it again and they'd marked it again. And, uh, so I put a game camera on it to be like, what is going on? Like, what, like, am I just losing it entirely? And it was an animal I'd collared three years before <laughs> <laughs> that had not somehow not been shot, mm -hmm. but was from a, like, the, was from my original study. I was now working on the, the, the next graduate student study, helping him capture. And, and I, when I looked up what scent Lauren set, I'd caught her on. Cause I, I keep notes on all of that. It was the exact same thing. Huh. How about that? She, knew. Yeah, she did. She was like, Oh, I've seen this. Exactly. So it's a good story. That's so, so, so yeah. mix them up. Yeah. It was a great story. It failed. Yeah. <laughs> I caught her smart. once at I least. Mean, yeah. yeah. I know. I'm teasing. Catch her one time. <laughs> I think they are just unbelievably yeah. no, smart. They are. Yeah. It's super smart. Super so I, I, I just think we all just have, you know, listening to these stories and, I still don't like them anymore, but I do have a respect for them. Sure, sure. Kind of like you, Lane. Like, I don't like you that much either, Bobby. <laughs> it's just, Especially if you're in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. So. it's coming up, by the way. So, Dudley, why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Why don't we ask her some rapid fire? Oh, yeah. oh boy, rapid fire time! You. <laughs> Do you know, did you know about this? No, I was not aware of this. Where's I asked my... if there was a quiz. <laughs> yeah. So he's going to, he's going to throw a couple things out there at you and you can say one or the other or neither or both. One. Then, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be pretty easy. So it's, it's just some quick questions. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. brought to you by our friends at Springfield Armory. They make some great pistols that trappers can use to dispatch right. uh, whatever they whatever call. Whatever needs to be dispatched. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and they can So Dudley's really he, he's behind. He's the brains behind this. So it, if anything is offensive, it's all Dudley. That's right. No, <laughs> Bobby and I actually, have nothing to do with it. Actually, I do have a little help. Bobby helps me some. Ken Ivy helps me some. So I'm having flashbacks yeah. to when I had to take board exams. Okay. <laughs> all, right. all right. So you can say. There is no wrong answer. Yeah. You can say neither, whatever. Okay. But uh, all right. Are we ready? Sure. All right. Uh, sunrises or sunsets? Sunrise. Being a student or being a professor? Being a grad student. Ah. <laughs> Rockies or Appalachians? Ooh, Appalachians. Foothold or snare? Snare. Dirt or soil? Soil. Ooh. Uplands or bottomlands? Uplands. Summer or winter? Summer. Hike or hunt? Hike. Public or private land? Public. Gray fox or red fox? Gray fox. Lastly, hail state or go tigers? Hail state. Hey. <laughs> awesome job. That was good. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. That was good. Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed this, listening to her. Yeah. yeah. Totally intriguing, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Mississippi State just doesn't Never disappoint. Never sees Never does. Um, she's I, also done a dogs. lot of cool stuff with okay. soils, which is why I asked that question. So we may need to get her back on sometime. Hey, yeah, every time. Talk sure. about no-till and all uh, yeah. One you of the know, questions he was going to ask you is tissues or Kleenex, and I didn't see any point in that one. <laughs> Where'd you come up with that one? 
I don't know. <laughs> shampoo or shampoo plus conditioner. You know? oh, I, look at this hair. You have to have separate conditioner. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we've got one more, Miss Dana. We've okay. got one more. So we'd like to add, So what we do, people that listen to our podcast, there's a few people that listen to our podcast. If Two they, three now. If they give us a review, mm-hmm. they have a chance to win a prize. Okay. So we ask you a, uh, a trivia question. If you get it right, mm-hmm. one of our listeners wins a prize. Oh, boy. Okay. If you don't get it right, we give them your home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and Mac will ask you the question. Ask, ask Richie how often What are we I playing answer? for? Yeah. <laughs> what are we playing for? Well, so, he's got all that. So oh, this is actually a first. They're going to have a choice between a Nosler reloading manual Ooh. or – a bag of biologic protein peas. Nice. Yeah. Pressure's on. Yeah. All right. And so you're playing for AR Ag Pilot. So I would assume that's Arkansas Ag Pilot. Yeah, that that's g- a dangerous yeah. profession. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially with AR. Absolutely. So I, <laughs> Bobby came up with this one, and, and I really think it'll be in your wheelhouse. So, oh, I hope so. <laughs> so here we go. In upstate New York, there are some beautiful mountains called the Adirondacks. It's a Native American term for what? Oh, no. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm so sorry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you want to think about it just a second here while I look at Lanny. And, uh, I, I know the answer, but I've forgotten it. Yeah, I remember hearing the answer as it, well. It, and it's I worked not in com- the Adirondacks. And it, I, it's, I always thought it was comfortable chair. Oh. But it's, it's not. not. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, do you, you want to think about it? Just a I really don't. I don't know. Okay. Well, it's a really neat word, and yeah. it, it is a Native American word. And uh, so, Mac, why don't you go ahead? And- yeah, the, the word was first originated by the Mohawk tribe and used it to call the Algonquin tribe. Algonquin? Algonquin. Yeah. 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 I mean, That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's from Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a while with Adirondack. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it actually means bark eaters. And ah. we thought I'd get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So like the AR Ag Pilot, you might want to just email us anyway. We might. I, I we apologize. Might I anyway. deeply yeah, apologize. Right. <laughs> she knew. She knew a lot about coach. That's, that's right. Yeah, bark you eater. You can't be good at everything, you know. So uh, we learned that a few years ago at the shot show. Yeah, it we was, did. It was, Very but I always thought that was interesting. Bark, bark, eaters, bark eaters like beavers. I don't. I don't know. But I, the, it was kind of a, a derogatory term from the what when I asked towards Jews other, about it towards <laughs> ask Jews towards the other Indian tribes. It's like know, when I get called swamp, uh, swamp Yankee, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. My my grandmother would be you're a hundred percent Swamp Yankee, yeah. and that was yeah, that was it. Well, so. I noticed you said summer instead of winter, even though being from New York. So. Yeah, you know, I had to think for a minute because I like I like winter down here. Uh, I like summer much better though. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah, I don't like being cold. Me neither. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, our summers are pretty hot. How did you adjust to uh, red bugs and ticks and sugars? Well, you got ticks. Well, up I got there. plenty of ticks up there. Um, you know, I do all right. It turns out I'm, I, I like the heat. I really do. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. Me too. Well, well guys, you're better I, if you're down here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dana. I've I've really enjoyed yeah. this. I have too. This has been really fun. Yeah. And I would look. I'm begging you to come back and let's do one on bears. Absolutely. Yeah. But also, play, Richie is not a bad guy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> his email or his phone call, please. I said you're saying you're giving cool. up my number. Yeah. I was like, I don't answer that phone. <laughs> no, I will definitely. So. We'd like we'd like to do that. And, yeah. Uh, so we're, we we love these topics. I yeah, we do. Yeah. This was anything that has to do with nature. Yeah. Obviously, we're yeah. completely intrigued. And anything we can learn. I mean, that's part of being a game kid. We just want to soak up everything we can. Mm-hmm. And to your point, we've been talking about having a black bear podcast for two years. Yeah, we have. Yeah, sure have. Sure, sure have. So, Black bears in the well, south. Well, I, yeah. I think we've been trying to get in touch with her. For they ha- I think. She's been studying <laughs> codes. I mean, they're hard to track. I don't blame her. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll yeah. tell you what, I'll bring, I'm not, not only I'll bring all of my grad students studying black bears, too. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah that'd be fun. Yeah. All right. What am I forgetting? Is there anything? Did, did we learn anything? I, I learned something every time. Do you, uh, intriguing. do you need to give a shout out to anybody or tell everybody how to got an Instagram Contact handle. You. No, I got, I, uh, I'll thank Bronson Strickland for uh, getting me to answer your email. So. <laughs> Bronson's all right. Yeah. yeah, he is. But so can people follow you on Instagram? Or 
Uh, you... No, I'm on Facebook. I'm old, so I'm on Facebook. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they can absolutely friend me on Facebook, and I'm I usually you'll just see random posts about bears. So that's, sweet, yeah. Sometimes okay. coyotes, yeah. Yeah, so we'll probably have the in the show notes. I'm looking over at Rob, who's nodding his head, and he he'll put the, all that information Great. in the show notes. So. Is there anything else we need to – the NWTF show is coming up pretty coming soon. Coming on so up. We'll, yeah, got a lot of good stuff going on there. You heard a little bit, you know, 50th anniversary of NWTF. The Fox Vest. Uh, there'll be some announcements about some other stuff. Companions, obviously, is going to be a big thing there too. Uh, and then you'll probably hear us a little bit uh, talk about a little project we got going on with Dr. Chamberlain too uh, with the Wild Turkey Labs. So That's right. Come we, on by and see us. A lot of good stuff going on. Dudley, you, what about you? You got I anything was, to add? No, I was going to ask Rob if he had anything to add. Rob's been burning the candle at both ends, bro. <laughs> I don't have anything to add on this one. Huh. Okay. Well, Rob, we're, we gave you a chance there. <laughs> <laughs> well, this no, has, has been fun. It's been really fun. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This has been yeah. great. I appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. great. Well, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.